welcome to the lecture of atomic structure in this lecture we are going to discuss what is the structure of atom then how electrons are organized in atom so almost all fundamental things regarding atom we are going to discuss here but the first question is what is an atom so we are starting out from beginning and end will be uh, at a deep con uh, configuration electronic configuration so first question what is an atom so atom is defined as it is smallest particle of an element possessing all chemical properties of that element so from this definition it is very clear that what is element so we have to discuss now what is an element but uh, rather that i should go this way that how this universe is made up of so with our present knowledge so why i am saying our present knowledge because now scientists are accepting there is tremendous matter categories of matter that we are not aware so whatever our knowledge is there that is hardly 5% about this universe that is given by scientist so if scientists are having 5% knowledge then just consider what i should have that knowledge and with that knowledge i am going to teach so first thing uh, we are dividing this part whatever on earth let us consider in case of earth so uh, it is mixture compound and an element what is mixture mixture can be mixture of any two elements one element and one compound or a uh, two compound and like that probabilities are there that means more than one component should be there so it may be 10 mixtures or uh, 10 compounds mixture 10 elements mixture anything you can consider but minimum two components are required both components must be either one is element one is compound both may be compound or both may be element there is no fixed proportion in case of mixing say for example i will take 1 mg common salt that is called as sodium chloride so 1 mg common salt in 1 liter water i may take 10 g common salt in 1 liter water so what are the considerations are there they are considered as mixture now from mixture we can separate out compounds or elements with comparatively easier method i am using word comparatively say for example i am having salt solution Uh, that is our sea water so we can take sea water we can evaporate on evaporation water will get uh, lost and whatever the remaining they are a mixture of salts predominantly sodium chloride but apart from that magnesium chloride calcium chloride and variety of salts may be there depending upon where is the sea and what are the effluents then uh, if you means uh, say for example uh, if uh, we are near mumbai then chemical zone is there and variety of chemicals they are also entering in the sea so in traces this type of chemicals will also get there in the salt so we can separate out water from salt comparatively easy method now in case of compound uh, the separation is not that easy i am not saying easy it is not that easy but in case of compound there is fixed proportion of combining element say for example i am carrying out electrolysis of water you are aware of the formula h2o so let me tell you you will get uh, automatically afterwards knowledge just i am giving you example here therefore i am giving some data so suppose i am decomposing water uh, by passing electrical current then water will give me that uh, whatever the amount that is give me in the proportion of 1s to 8 one part of hydrogen by weight eight part of oxygen by weight in that ratio i should get the things so there is fixed ratio between combining element in case of compounds but what is an element so whatever the compounds you can able to separate out on separation of compound we have to carry out various method that is called as decomposition your other composition that means to join thing together decomposition to make separate 
so here we are getting decomposition of the substance uh, say for example just now i told that water on passing out electrical current it will be acidified or salty water should required because conductance should be there but predominantly on electrolysis of water we are getting hydrogen and oxygen this is called as electrical decomposition whereas if you are decomposing calcium carbonate okay can we carry out one simple exercise uh, just i'm going to write here this substance that is called as calcium carbonate we are going to heat it this is the symbol of heat that means we are heating out strongly say for example around 600 degree celsius if you are heating out uh, but what is calcium carbonate where from where to obtain it is limestone or even we can consider powder of marble and uh, chalk a uh, chalk means not present a what chalks are there dustless chalk etc they are not there but naturally occurring part is there that is called like chalk so that everything consisting of calcium carbonate so i am heating out calcium carbonate strongly i will get here calcium oxide plus carbon dioxide now in front of carbon dioxide i have to put here an arrow a four arrow that is indicating this is a gas so this is called as thermal decomposition why thermal because we are heating out and then substances are getting decomposed so this decomposition is called as thermal decomposition now here this calcium carbonate that is called as limestone this is what we are obtaining here that is called as quick lime so like that substances are there now this is something we are talking about thermal decomposition so we are having electrical decomposition method we are having thermal decomposition method sometime we are using a method that is called as chemical decomposition uh, but it is not actually perfect but we can consider that say for example uh, iron oxides are there Uh, generally we can consider fe2o3 but variety of iron oxides are there if they are reacting with carbon then we are getting iron this reaction is not balanced i will teach afterwards balancing out and carbon dioxide is released so this is actually uh, here we are considering under chemical decomposition so like that variety of uh, reactions are there they are there for decomposition now when we are decomposing out the substance and finally we are getting something say for example here i am getting iron in previous reaction i was getting there uh, either hydrogen or oxygen or both thing so like that things are there on further decomposition method that substance should not undergo decomposition so whatever you are going to carry out on iron iron will not undergo further decomposition therefore iron is called as an element same way hydrogen is called as an element oxygen is called as an element because they are not undergoing further decomposition so now part of definition we discuss that is what is called as an element the smallest particle of that element possessing all chemical properties of that element that is called as an atom But this is all hypothetical concept. In Europe, there was a person named as Democritus. He proposed the theory of atom in Europe. In India, similar theory was discussed in the literature that is called as Vaisheshik Darshan, given by a great person named as Aulukya. But later on, he is famous as Kanadu. So the concept of atoms they were there. but uh, again keep in mind uh, they were hypothetical concept at that time the real change in this method was carried out by a great scientist that is called as dalton dalton first time given a fantastic data what about atom but uh, i am always having doubt that he might have confused about atoma in sanskrit and atom in greek 
or whatever that uh, European language. Uh, what is the principle? He says atom is smallest indivisible part of an element possessing all chemical properties of that element. Secondly, one cannot convert atom of one element into atom of other element. Third, one cannot destroy existing atom. Next, one cannot create new atom. So like that principles are given by Dalton. But yet, there was lot of confusion whether atoms are there or not. Because the debate was there. And in science, these type of debates are welcome. The literal change was occurred in development of modern physics. Particularly after 1896, whatever the developments are there, they are considered under modern physics development. So now we are focusing in next part about modern physics. In this part, we are going to discuss how pressure is measured. For that purpose, a device is used that is called as barometer. This is made up of mercury. The person who invented this, uh, his name is Tori Sealy. So, we are going to discuss what is now barometer. Uh, now keep in mind my drawing is not that good but I will try to draw something you have to understand it and secondly whatever diagrams I am drawing here they are just schematic diagram schematic means for the purpose of study only I am showing don't ask me that how to be standing automatically and all that so let us start uh, first you have to take a tube which is hard glass tube. Why it is hard glass, I will explain. But right now we have to consider this is hard glass tube. Now this hard glass tube is having length of 1 meter. So you have to take that 1 meter, you are aware 1 meter means 100 centimeter. So here the tube is having length 1 meter, which is filled completely by an element you are aware of this element this is called as mercury latin name is hydrargyrum therefore symbol is hg now this mercury we have to fill till top in case of mercury keep in mind there are two types of forces in liquid we are considering one is called as cohesive forces and other is called as adhesive forces adhesive forces means uh, molecules of that liquid is having affinity towards other molecule. Cohesive forces means affinity of same molecule with same molecule. So in case of mercury, cohesive forces are more than adhesive forces. Therefore mercury will come like this, bulging out. Like that mercury will be there. So this is now completely filled with mercury. Now we have to take another dish which is also filled with mercury. Little bit. Now, I want to invert this tube in this tube. So, this way, I will invert now tube and I will keep this tube as this way. Now, initially, I have filled this complete tube with mercury, but now I am making invert, uh, inverted tube. Now, what is the expected thing? Because of gravity, all mercury should come down. Mercury is having very high density. Density means mass upon volume. So, it is having density more than 13 gram per cc cubic centimeter. So, here mercury will, uh, we are expecting that mercury should go down. And a level here should get increased. 
this way. But practical data shows that it is not happening to 100%. Mercury is going down, but to little bit extent. Say for example, if you are there at sea level, then we will find that mercury will be there something like this. And if you are marking here, this is approximately 7, uh, 76 centimeters. You are aware this total part is 100 centimeter. Out of that, this is 76 centimeter. Mercury is not falling down. Actually, it should, but only this much of portion get vacated out. Whereas here it is there. The thing is that Earth is having tremendous gravitational force. Because of that, Earth is pulling out atmosphere. Atmosphere means gases. They are pulled towards Earth. As a result, the pressure is there that is called as atmospheric pressure. So here we are getting atmospheric pressure over here. Because of that pressure, mercury is not able to fall down. Little bit it will fall and then equilibrium will establish. Suppose I am going in higher altitude. Sea level is there. Apart from sea level I will go to higher altitude. Then the thing is that atmospheric pressure will start decreasing out. As a result, if this pressure is decreased, then downward moment is possible. And this way, mercury level will start falling down. So, for approximately every 160 meter altitude, real number is 165 meter, but uh, for general purpose, we are for calculation purpose, we are considering this as 160 meter. So, for 160 meter altitude, mercury level will fall by 1 mm, 1 millimeter. So, here if I am considering this as 760 centi, uh, sorry, uh, I should consider this as 760 millimeter. So, suppose I am at sea level, it should be 760 mm of mercury. But when I will go 160 meter higher altitude, the level of mercury will fall by 1 mm. Suppose I am going 1600 meter altitude, level of mercury will fall by 10 millimeter. So like that atmospheric pressure will decrease. So this way, this is the height of mercury column that is measured and we can measure uh, atmospheric pressure over here. The instrument is called as barometer. The instrument is designed by a person named as Tori Sealy. And then he told that whatever the thing here, this is vacuum. Why? Because mercury is going down, but mercury is a dense metal. It is in liquid state, but metal, very dense metal. And the result, when it is going down, it is not displacing out air. If air is displaced, then barometer will not work. So, there is a vacuum. This vacuum is named as Tori Sealy's vacuum. So, here we are getting practically creation of vacuum. No doubt it is not up to 100%, but very great vacuum is produced over here. That is called as Tori Sealy's vacuum. Now, if you are increasing pressure here, then automatically mercury will rise. So, if you are taking this instrument, and going under the soil, then obviously under the soil means we have to make tunnel and go downwards. Particularly you are aware of mines and all that. So if you are going to mines, then you will get idea that pressure is increasing out. So this way we can measure pressure that is in terms of uh, millimeter of mercury. So uh, we are considering 760 mm of mercury. Pressure is written this way. 760 mm of mercury that is considered as one atmospheric pressure. You are aware that as we are going to higher the altitude, pressure will decrease. That's why lot of changes occur. But right now we are just considering here barometer and how pressure is calculated here. So on barometer we are getting pressure in terms of 760 mm of mercury.
we are aware of how pressure is measured that is with help of barometer now we have to discuss another like similar concept here because we are discussing here atomic structure but we are discussing how pressure is measured what is element because this is all things we required here so we can understand the concept very clearly now here we are focusing now on a topic that is cathode rays experiment let us uh, discuss this in germany there was a glass blower named as uh, i don't know how to pronounce that but either gessler or gessler something name is like that so that gessler or gessler he uh, produced a tube that is called as hard glass tube having electrodes fitted in it uh, okay just we discuss barometer at that time also we use the word hard glass tube the thing is that atmospheric pressure is very very high in our further discussion at some point uh, not in this lecture but in another lecture of physics we are going to discuss what is that great value of atmospheric pressure but right now i must uh, uh, it was be very clear that pressure is equivalent to nearly weight of three elephants so suppose hard glass tube uh, sorry ordinary glass tube is kept then what will happen suppose this is a tube atmospheric pressure that is almost equivalent to three elephants at a time they are pressing down the tube but it is not breaking why it is not breaking because there is some opening and from inside also same pressure is balanced out but the moment you start evacuating this evacuating means what you have to remove air from this as a result pressure from here will decrease and then tube may break so in order to avoid this rupture we have to use here hard glass tube so that can withstand this very very high pressure so for that purpose we are using here hard glass tube now gessler or gessler he produced hard glass tube and he provided some good things to this hard glass tube again telling this is just schematic diagram he put electrodes in this tube at the same time uh, he was there to make provision here so we can connect it to evacuation pump and we can evacuate this so from here we are evacuating that means what we are doing removing air from the tube whereas we placed here two electrodes let us consider this is as cathode cathode means here in this experiment we have to consider a cathode as negative electrode and here positive because when we discuss electrochemistry in that chapter we are considering at some stages negative is cathode uh, uh, sorry anode and positive is cathode so like that things are also there therefore i am telling you that negative is not always cathode but in this experiment negative is cathode and positive is anode so this way electrodes are fed now scientists started working on this hard glass tube provided with electrode you are aware of electricity if you are having a dry cell pencil cell or triple a a battery that uh, something like that you can check out the emf or voltage given there is 1.5 volt you can check out your uh, mobile phone's charger it is having input voltage something 230 to 110 volt like that input voltage whereas output voltage is 5 volt or plus than that so like that various voltages we can convert with help of transformer one type of transformer is called as step down transformer what is the role of step down transformer to decrease emf to reduce voltage say for example you have your cell phone charger it reduces voltage from 230 volt to 5 volt or 6 volt depending upon the capacity so transformer one type is step down transformer other type of transformer is there that is called as step up transformer that is there to rise voltage now here the voltage uh, rise is expected so scientist started rising voltage inside this whereas reducing pressure 
you are aware now pressure is measured in terms of 760 mm of mercury 760 mm of mercury is considered as one atmospheric pressure with help of this evacuation pump we can connect it to barometer and we can measure pressure inside scientists decrease out pressure till almost 10 mm of mercury so atmospheric pressure now decreases to very great uh, not atmospheric pressure inside the tube that was decreased to very very great extent that is almost 10 cm uh, 10 mm of mercury that means 1 cm of mercury and emf implemented is more then they were able to observe some crackling noise in the tube later on they were able to observe some lines of light inside the tube then onwards entire tube was having some sort of glow color then that were fragmented and like that variety of thing ultimately when pressure was in range of 0.1 mm of mercury see 0.1 mm of mercury almost vacuum and then emf the voltage is about 8000 volt at that time suddenly there was a darkness in the tube and then they observed the opposite side of cathode this is cathode opposite side of cathode the glass start emitting green color light this is something strange light is not produced from inside part it is produced from glass and then it is considered as discovery of cathode rays cathode is emitting something uh, radiations because of that radiations glass start glowing now scientists discovered another substance that is named as zinc sulfide they will call sulfate the name is zinc sulfide so scientists uh, got the knowledge that if invisible radiations particularly high energy invisible radiations they are falling on zinc sulfide then zinc sulfide start glowing white color uh, white light now substance is there therefore i am telling important import information maximum compounds of zinc are white only those who are compounds formed directly by zinc like zinc oxide zinc chloride zinc sulfide always keep in mind zinc compounds are having white color technically speaking we have to say they are colorless but practically speaking we are saying it is white but uh, ultimately we have to say it is colorless so zinc sulfide is almost colorless but we are saying it is white uh, you might have noticed in old days that tube lights were there not led tube light but uh, having choke starter like that tube lights were there in that tube light this white color powder is kept that is zinc sulfide whereas invisible radiations particularly beam of electron and ions they are getting collided with that screen and it start glowing giving white color so you have observed this all so this is zinc sulfide screen now scientists apply zinc sulfide over here in this portion they apply zinc sulfide and they realize that this portion is glowing with white light now not green they apply green light uh, sorry zinc sulfide everywhere but only opposite to the cathode that portion is glowing now they change the location of anode they place anode here now this is now anode they change the direction of anode still they observe radiations are going perpendicular to the surface of cathode that means it was very clear that radiations were emitted by cathode presence of anode is important but direction of anode is not important you can place anywhere anode here so this way first data of cathode rays that we got that cathode radiations are produced by cathode they are perpendicular to surface of cathode position of anode is not mattering out this now some modified tubes were produced again i am telling these are all schematic diagram you can consider this is now something like tv screen now here we have placed anode this is something like tv screen from front side it is 
uh, rectangular. So like that uh, tubes are produced where they place here track. Okay, but prior to track, I just consider uh, forget of track. Uh, first consider this way. Uh, they place here anode, cathode, and they place external electrical field. So this is positively charged. This is negative charge. Why I am saying here external electric field? The thing is that this is internal electric field. This is placed outside tube, but consider when high voltage is applied, you will find the beam that was going straight line initially, but in application of this electrical field, beam started deviating towards, deviating means change the path towards positive plate. You are aware there is attraction between positive and negative. So here, negatively uh, positive uh, they are getting attracted towards positive that means cathode rays must possess negative charge so this is one more information we got now uh, just as I explained uh, they place here track again and again I am telling this is all schematic diagram don't ask me how track is floating there and all that and they place here a wheel something like this wheel is placed here and they started current you will get the wheel is rotating in this direction that means cathode rays possess mass because they are able to implement force because of force only motion is there Without force motion is not possible. You are aware of the formula F equal to mass into acceleration. As a result, force is there. That means there must be mass and acceleration. So cathode rays possess mass. And then based on previous data that uh, how the curve is there and uh, what is the deviation of uh, cathode rays in presence of electrical charge and then what is the way, what is the mass of wheel, what is force required to move that and with what speed that it is getting. Scientists were able to calculate a ratio. This ratio that is called as E by M ratio. E stands for charge and M stands for mass. So here we are getting E by M ratio that is charge to mass ratio. So here we got now ratio that is charge to mass ratio for cathode rays. So this is all uh, we can discuss, describe something about cathode ray. Now we are discussing about a fantastic experiment here carried out by Sir J. J. Thomson, a British physicist. He carried out this experiment. He used different metals as a cathode. I am revising. He used different metals as a cathode here. And every time by using different element as cathode, he calculated a charge to mass ratio that is E by M ratio and to the surprise he got ratio as constant let me clarify suppose we are saying 1 by 2 5 by 10 100 by 200 9 by 18 so variety of values I am considering here, but you are aware, ultimately all value that is ending with 1 by 2. So here 5 ones are 5 twos are, it's 1 by 2. 0, 0, 0, 0 cancel, remaining 1 by 2. 9 ones are 9 twos are, 1 by 2. So like that, ratio is constant. So whatever element is there, but it is emitting 
same type of cathode rays. That means cathode rays must be made up of a material which is there present everywhere. Uh, on this assumption, because variety of metals, they are emitting same type of cathode rays. And then he termed that particle as an electron, smallest unit or smallest part of electricity, electrical current like that. But he named this part as electron. This is the revolutionary concept. This is the first subatomic particle. See, till here, we were not aware that we were having doubt atoms may be there or not there. But now it is sure that subatomic particles they are discovered that is he termed as electrons. But electron is negatively charged. And you are aware that atom is electrically neutral. So, Sir J. J. Thompson said that in order to balance this, there must be equal and opposite positive charge must be present in the atom. And this way, he was able to explain neutrality of that atom. Now, on basis of this, the first atomic model was put forward by Sir J. J. Thompson. He says that there is presence of, uh, there may be presence, uh, must be presence of positive charge. So, he says atom is essentially a sphere, sphere of positive charge. Why sphere? So, why moon is spherical, why sun is spherical, various stars are spherical, earth is spherical. For a given mass, minimum surface area is available in case of sphere. The most distant particles are equidistant in case of sphere. And therefore, because mass is acting towards center, and therefore atom is essentially a sphere of positive charge. And he says electrons are embedded in between, negatively charged electrons are embedded in between, like seeds in watermelon. And therefore, this model is known as watermelon model. So, according to Sir J. J. Thompson, atom is an, uh, uh, we have to consider it is a sphere of positive charge and electrons are embedded in between like seeds in watermelon. This model is able to explain electrical neutrality of an atom, but only that. It is not able to explain variety of things like spectra and all these things. Uh, then how positive and negative charge they are together with each other, not explained. So like that, various things are not explained by this model. And therefore, this model is discarded. But this is the first model of an atom. Now let us talk of positive charge. We discussed that electrons, they are having negative charge. Electrons were discovered by Sir J. J. Thomson in cathode ray tube experiment. Now same way, uh, there is a scientist named as Goldstein. You can consider, you are aware of Einstein. Similarly, you can consider Goldstein. Goldstein consider atom, uh, sorry, as cathode rays are there, there must be anode rays. And he started investigating about anode rays. For that purpose, uh, now uh, he used something different too. Now here, uh, he placed anode something like this. But still, he was not getting presence of anode rays. Then he made some different thing. Uh, this is cathode. He made anode as perforated. Perforated means holes were kept in anode. And now, by making holes, he says that whatever the radiations uh, they are emitted, sorry, uh, reverse way, uh, he make indication also reverse. So, this is cathode which is perforated anode as it is. And then, he says that we have to start cathode rates uh, that are EMF we have to increase. We have to make this way so anode will emit radiation, they will pass through cathode. And surprisingly, he got glow. 
in this region and therefore he says it is discovery of anode rings then he applied external magnetic field in case of external magnetic field it is proved that anode rays are getting deflected towards negative part and therefore it is concluded that presence of positive charge in the atom that positively charged particle is named as proton this way there was discovery of proton another sub atomic particle in later on it was proved that there is no such radiation called as anode rays actually till that he given them as anode rays then channel rays canal rays like that because channels are made because of this perforated cathode and so these names are given but later on proved that no such radiations are there anode is not emitting any radiation but you are aware that here we are decreasing out atmospheric pressure to very low but yet residual gases are there these gases are getting ionized because of cathode rays and on ionization the positive charge ions they get deflected towards negatively charged cathode and we are getting presence of anode rays so in wrong experiment but proof is perfect that is presence of positive charge that was there so this way now atom is having electron as well as proton two particles are considered here this is the discovery of anode rays by goldstein presence of protons are proved but uh, now doubt is there that what is the atomic structure and then disciple of sir j j thomson named as sir arnest rutherford from new zealand he was initially from new zealand but later on he moved towards england no no british colony only but he went there and then he studied out and he carried out a, uh, that experiment that is called as gold foil experiment or alpha particle scattering experiment on basis of that he is the person who is able to give atomic structure let us discuss in next part we are discussing about rutherford's experiment that is gold foil experiment or alpha particle scattering experiment just uh, i will go to see schematic not actual diagram actual diagram is something different but schematically rutherford took a gold foil gold foil was uh, according to him it was very very thin gold foil so thin that hardly four atoms in thickness like that gold foil was taken by rutherford now this is photographic film or photographic plate this was something drawn like this and alpha particles are bombarded over this now at that time much things were not aware about alpha particle alpha particle is essentially positive charge particle approximate at that time they consider plus 2 it charge on alpha particles and then these alpha particles are bombarded over thin gold foil what was the observe uh, what was the expected thing that gold foil should stop alpha particles but what result he obtained there are strange result say maximum alpha particles traveled in straight line direction but few alpha particles 
got deflected by angle of 30 degree, 60 degree, 90 degree and so on. So like that alpha particles deflected also. Very very few, that means one out of million that had deflected by angle of 180 degree also. I don't know how they calculated. But let's say that one of uh, out of one million get deflected by 180 degree. On this data, that means actually it was expected that it would stop, but no, they get deflected by various angles and maximum traveled in straight line. On basis of this data, Rutherford says atom is essentially a hollow part. There are two types of space. There should be space between the atoms. He called that as interatomic space. As well as space is there within the atom also. When atom is hollow, then where is the mass of that atom? All mass is concentrated at the center, according to him. Because alpha particles are heavy particles. It travels with very high speed, say 3000 km per second. Unaccelerated alpha particle that is having speed somewhere around 3000 km per second to 30,000 km per second. Such a high speed alpha particles are there, but yet no holes are formed here. That means atoms are not displaced. So atoms entire mass should be focused in smaller area smaller region that is he called as nucleus he even measured the size of nucleus he says that it is one lakh times smaller than atomic size now uh, what is the thing it is essentially made up of positive charge all positive charge is focused in uh, nucleus therefore he says that if radiations are going like this they get deflected Okay, if it is going still closer, it gets deflected with larger angle and exactly head on collision, then only back 180 degree. And this way he concluded the thing. Now, where is the electron? He says electrons are extra nuclear electron. Extra nuclear means away from nucleus. So they are away from nucleus and they are revolving around nucleus like planets are revolving around sun. So that's why this model is called as solar system model of atom where now sun is at center, here nucleus is at center, here planets are revolving, here electrons are revolving around it. But in case of solar system, the force of attraction is gravitational force. What is the force of attraction here in case of atom? He says Electrical force of attraction, positive negative attraction is there because of that electrons are revolving around nucleus and this way model was put forward. No doubt various doubts are here. First doubt, obviously this model is not able to explain spectra. Second, electrons are revolving around nucleus, nucleus possesses all positive charge. But now Goldstein says that there is presence of proton. If all protons are there together inside nucleus, then why nucleus is breaking out? It should break out, break out. it should split because positive positive repulsion is there. How nucleus is stable then? Various doubts are there. Then according to wave mechanics, they say that if charged body is in motion, it should follow, uh, it should emit continuous spectra. It should emit energy continuously and fall down inside nucleus. For that purpose, time required is 10 raised to minus 8 second. Keep in mind, this is ultra high five minute time. Within 10 raised to minus 8 second, all electrons should fall in the nucleus and there should be atomic catastrophe. Touch wood, this is not happening. Why? That means there are some errors in the model and we have to rectify it. Okay. Now let us discuss about the rectification. But prior to that, I must explain because you might have heard again and again word that 
जैसे थॉमसन साइकोमिक मॉडल इज देयर नॉट एबल टू एक्सप्लेन स्पेक्ट्रा देन वी डिस्कस रुदर फोर्स मॉडल नॉट एबल टू एक्सप्लेन स्पेक्ट्रा सो व्हाट इज द मीनिंग ऑफ स्पेक्ट्रा वी आर गोइंग टू एक्सप्लेन नो वी आर डिस्कसिंग व्हाट इज द नेचर ऑफ लाइट बिकॉज इन ऑर्डर टू गेट नॉलेज अबाउट स्पेक्ट्रा वी हैव टू डिस्कस दिस पार्ट सो फर्स्ट पार्ट हियर दैट इज we can say uh, what is nature of light it is not 100% yet determined different theories are there first theory that is newton's corpuscular theory of light or radiation and second wave theory of light so right now we are considering wave theory of light as uh, our basis they say that light is in form of wave radiation is in form of wave now once i am saying that there is a wave certain characteristics of these waves we have to consider so we are first discussing the characteristics of waves you can see this way this is positive side this is negative side this is the wave uh let us uh, give similar example if there is a stagnant water pool of stagnant water and we are dropping a stone in that water so you will get concentric rings coming out from that concentric rings means having same center rings will come out that is called as waves then they will go towards periphery again they will come towards center like that situation is there now add some lighter material on it say for example piece of thermopole or say for example a balloon like that and then again drop that same stone you will find that whatever the thermopole piece that is not going towards periphery and coming towards the center you will find wave is going towards periphery and coming towards center but piece of thermopole will oscillate at its original position only it will move up and down like that you might have taken same experience particularly when boat or launch that is there at uh, you can say that jetty or something like that and then you can check that every time that wave is coming that uh, ship is oscillating up and down it is not going towards periphery and coming back it is just oscillating at that particular place now here you can check this way that this is the direction of propagation of wave that means this is center of pull this is periphery wave is going this way but particles will oscillate in this is the direction they will oscillate perpendicular to the direction of propagation of wave propagation means in which direction wave is going on so here the angle is of 90 degree therefore i am calling it is perpendicular so this type of waves they are called as transverse waves so light radiation that is a form of transverse waves so here we are getting these waves as transverse waves where particles will oscillate in this direction now here this is the maximum displacement now we are making here a line this is called as mean position so original water level was this after creation of wave we are getting something upward this is called as crest where is something going downward we are calling this as trough so one crest and one trough will account one wave so single part of wave is something we have to consider entire crest entire trough maximum displacement this is the mean position maximum displacement from mean position i can see this is x maximum therefore i am term uh, terminal uh, the terminology is that this is minima but this distance that is called as amplitude amplitude of wave means what till what extent uh, wave uh, that wave can go to higher height and lower height that is the same so this is called as amplitude now wave length now this is one wave i have drawn but may be possible i may draw this is the wave like that so how to calculate 
uh, how to determine wave length. Here, this is called as mean position. This is also mean position. Mean position. So one wave consider one crest, one trough. Therefore, distance between alternate mean position and so on again. First, we have to omit this and second. So distance between alternate mean position is called as wave length. So first we are determining here wave length, distance between alternate mean position. Now when we discuss this topic in physics, we are going to discuss somewhat more detail about this because only this is not the definition. Several other definitions are also there. But right now we can consider distance between alternate mean position that is wave length. So uh, wave length is denoted by a letter. This is called as lambda. Inverted by like uh, something. So this is called as lambda. This is wave length. Now speed of light. We are denoting by letter C. That is speed of light. Which is uh, 3 lakh kilometers per second. Approximately. Real answer something 2.99 etc. But right now we are considering as 3 lakh kilometers per second. That is speed of light. Now frequency. You are aware of wavelength. Another characteristic of this wave. That is called as frequency. Frequency is uh, now this is one wave or rather I should say one cycle. So number of cycles passing in a second uh, from particular point they are called as frequency. Uh, you are aware of train. Suppose I am standing on the railway station and I want to go to X direction. I will ask what is the frequency of train. It can be given like that. Uh, per hour 20 trains are there. So I will say 20 trains per hour. May be possible one train per hour. Yes, that is also frequency per unit time. How many trains are there? If I want to go by that through trains are there, long distance train, then it may be there like that one train per day. So unity change from hour to day. Certain long distance trains, they are twice in a week. So I have to say two trains per week. So like that frequency. So here cycle per second. How many cycles per second? One cycle per second that is called as hertz. Because the uh, person worked on this is having name as hertz. So one cycle per second is called as hertz. So one hertz means one cycle per second. So frequency. Frequency is denoted by liter. This is something called as nu. So now we have frequency that is determined by letter nu. So you are aware wavelength is there. Now here obvious thing is there. I am drawing another wave. If light is there that means speed is constant of that light. At that time suppose I am saying this is another wave. Like that. Now, here what is increase? Wave length. So, in a second, suppose here two waves are passing. Red one. Two waves are passing. But blue one will pass only one wave. Here, we will get wave length is more. Here, wave length is less. So, in case of blue wave, you will find that wave length is more. In case of this red color mentioned, wave length is less. Wavelength is less, frequency is more. Wavelength is more, frequency is less. And therefore, we can connect this way that uh, frequency is inversely proportional to wavelength. Wavelength is less means frequency is more. But I have always problem with this type of sign. This is the sign of proportionality. And I want to remove it. How we can remove sign of proportionality? So keep in mind always when, uh, when we are removing sign of proportionality, we have to put some constant over there. So nu here I will put sign and put some constant over here lambda. 
So actually the thing is that uh, I have to uh, apply this way. This is 1, 1 by lambda and multiply by some constant, equality sign and constant that is substituting out this. So this way we are getting substitution of uh, constant over here. So in short, I am writing this way that nu that is equal to some constant into lambda. Now, uh, same way, energy is there. Every radiation is associated with energy. I hope you are aware of microwave oven. A clistron tube is there in the microwave oven that is producing out strong mic microwave radiations. Microwaves, they are uh, produced and absorbed by water molecule. That's why if aqueous substance is kept in microwave oven, then it is going to get hot quickly. But if water is not there, it will not get heated. Say for example, if you are placing a paper dish and potato on that and keeping in microwave oven, you will find potato is getting hot but paper dish will not. If you are keeping something in glass, then also you will experience the same thing that glass vessel will not remain hot or become hot. But whatever inside material is there, say for example potato or something like that, it is getting heated. So this is something we are talking about microwave. So here, uh, microwave, they are having energy, sunlight, you are observed, pavimentous energy is there. So formula is that energy of radiation is directly proportional to frequency of that radiation. Now you are aware of frequency. So energy equal to, now I have to remove this equality sign and put here some constant. So again I will put some constant and write down this way energy equal to constant into nu. Now everywhere these constants we are using and uh, then again and again we are using k as constant instead of that some specific constants are there. Uh, let us discuss about these constants. So nu is equal to what we discussed k by lambda. But uh, you can check out uh, we here this relation is true only and only if speed of light is constant then only this relation is true. Therefore we are considering speed of light here as constant. We are aware speed of light is uh, denoted by letter c. So right now I am changing out this k now by c. So nu is equal to c by lambda. Whereas here E is equal to, now this uh, K is replaced by a letter H. Theory was put forward by a German scientist named as Max Planck. According to him, light is no doubt in wave but not in continuous form. It is in form of bundles. He says that bundle as quantum, single bundle as quantum, plural as quantum. So light is coming in form of quanta and each quanta, uh, each quantum is having energy that is H nu. H is called as Planck's constant. C is called as speed of light. Whereas here H that is called as Planck's constant. I don't know what is connection between H and Planck's constant. But here consider that H as Planck's constant. Now you are aware nu that is equal to here also nu is there so can I substitute value of nu over here and answer is yes so E is equal to H C by lambda so this way we can correlate energy as well as wavelength based on this data we can now classify radiations we are <coughs> aware of radiations and I will give you here a general idea about radiation and then we will come to know what is the meaning of spectra. So we will start here about the radiations. I will uh, give here some uh, chart. Now keep in mind this chart I am arranging this way. This is increasing level of energy. Single axis graph is there. As well as I can say increasing level of frequency. Whereas uh, if this direction I am drawing, 
I have to write here wavelength. So here we are getting shortest wavelength. Here we are getting longest wavelength. Here we are getting greatest energy. Here we are getting smallest energy. So like that radiations are there. So first I will write here. Okay. This is cosmic radiations. So clear it is cosmic radiations. But no much things are known about this cosmic radiation. Therefore, I have placed here a dotted line uh, because some books are mentioning cosmic radiation, some books are not mentioning. But surely known radiation here that is gamma. Don't get confused with nu and gamma. If at all it's there, then problem of Greek language. Okay, so this is radiation that is gamma, which is very 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 small wavelength is having because it is. Wavelength is small, wavelength is big. So here wavelength is smaller, smallest wavelength is there in range of 0.1 angstrom. What is angstrom? Uh, in physics lecture fundamentals we will see that uh, it is 10 raised to minus 10 meter. So even 0.1 ang uh, angstrom is range of these gamma rays. Then X rays, actually a variety of groups are there. Of X rays, but here right now I am mentioning only superficially, so they are called as X rays. Then ultraviolet radiations are there, but we are calling them vacuum ultraviolet. Why vacuum ultraviolet? Because their existence is there in ultraviolet radiation, their existence in vacuum. The moment they enter in atmosphere, they get absorbed. Then ultraviolet, then violet. So we can keep in mind sequence this way, vacuum ultraviolet, ultraviolet and violet. Now violet onwards, so I am changing out color here of pen. Violet onwards, the radiations are different that is Vibgeon. So violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. So this range that is called as visible range of light. So here we are getting this all visible things here. Only this much spectra is visible. Now red onwards we are getting here infrared. Then far infrared. Then microwave. Then radio waves. So these are all radiations are again invisible. So these radiations are low energy, these radiations are high energy and these radiations visible radiation. So this is called as spectra. Initially uh, light scattered through prism that is called as spectra but now we realize that apart from this visible part this is high energy invisible radiation this part is low energy visible radiation. Now it is uh, again and again I want to tell that when we were discussing about J.J. Thompson's atomic model or Rutherford's atomic model, we were telling this way that it is not able to explain spectra. The thing is that every radiation, whatever the wavelength is associated with energy and particular element is emitting out particular wavelength only. That is called as characteristic wavelength. Say for example sodium. On heating, one of the spectra of sodium is golden yellow. A few years ago, you were aware that uh, street lamps, they were called as sodium vapor lamp. They are having golden yellow color. Now that is replaced by LED. But uh, some 4-5 or five years ago, these lamps were made up of uh, sodium vapor lamp. And may be possible some of the cities might have continued that sodium vapor lamp use also. So that sodium vapor lamp that is having golden yellow color that is characteristic wavelength of sodium. That's why if you observe from distance, say for example we are there in Mumbai. So when we are crossing out creek, at that time we were observing distant series of these lamps. All lamps are having same shade of golden yellow. It is not some, something is having pinkish, something is having reddish, like that, no. Everywhere the shade is same. So that is called as characteristic spectra of 
that particular element. So why particular element emits only particular wavelength? Say for example, if potassium is there, potassium will emit lilac color. Calcium is there, it will emit apple green color. So why particular element emits particular color only? So this is not explained on basis of J.J. Thomson's atomic model as well as Rutherford's atomic model. And that's why we have to consider that uh, the spectra is not explained on basis of this model. And to overcome this all, a new model was put forward that is called as Bohr's atomic model. Now henceforth, our study will go in much more detail. So let us consider now Bohr's model in next lecture. Niels Bohr proposed out uh, or say suggested some doubts in Rutherford's model and later on he considered Rutherford's model as standard model only with certain changes. Say for example, uh, this is a nucleus. Rutherford is saying electrons are revolving around that uh, nucleus in circular orbit. Uh, instead of that, now correction is that it is revolving in spherical way. So three dimensional view is there. Niels Bohr put forward a derivation. By that derivation, he was able to prove that when electrons, when they are revolving in particular prescribed path, that is called as, uh, according to him, he called that as orbital or orbit. So if that electron is following that prescribed path, then it will not fall in the nucleus. It will remain unchanged. So it will follow either spherical path but not change out to the spiral path and fall in the nucleus. Step by step, electron can be promoted to upper orbital by absorbing energy and lower orbital by releasing energy. Like that concepts were introduced by Niels Bohr, but right now what I am speaking, I must explain it in detail. So, uh, let us start now, instead of that Bohr's derivation, uh, because I am going to take that derivation, but not in this part. So, in some other lecture, I will give that uh, entire derivation, because right now we are interested in electronic configuration and atomic structure. So, uh, just consider that outcome of that derivation we are discussing now. So first part, that is uh, how electrons are arranged in the atom. See, initially we were having doubt whether atom is there or not. Then some atomic particles were produced. Now what is atomic structure? After that, we say that where and how electrons are arranged. So for that purpose, Niels Bohr put forward certain laws. No doubt. It is not that Niels Bohr thought, therefore he placed. No, with mathematical expressions, he said, these are, these are the things they are going to happen. So out of that, first important thing, that what is the capacity of elect, uh, atom, uh, orbital. So we have to discuss now capacity of orbital. This is nucleus. This is first orbit, second orbit, third orbit, and so on. Niels Bohr says that, Capacity of orbit is equal to 2n square provided n is orbit number. So suppose I am talking about this is the nucleus, this is first orbit, this is second, third, like that orbits are there. Then uh, first orbit, second orbit, third orbit. How many electrons can be there in orbit? For that purpose he says that number of electron, the maximum number of electron, they can be there, that is equal to 2 into n square. So n stands for number of orbit. So in first orbit, 
2 into 1 square. So you are aware that 2 into 1 square is 1. So answer is 2. Second orbit means n equal to 2. Then 2 into 2 square. That will be equal to 2 into 4. That is 8. Now this way you can calculate n equal to 3. Then 2 into 3 square. That will be 2 into 9. So 18. And so on. So this is the condition. But how many electrons are there in atom? That topic now we have to discuss. So here we are now discussing how uh, how many electrons, protons, neutrons they are there in atom. Any element uh, we can give some symbols say for example X. Now you are aware that these symbols they are given in Latin language. Therefore uh, name of element should be there in Latin. Whatever the Latin name is there accordingly symbols are given. But I am just describing here how element uh, is written. So this is some symbol X of that element. Here we are writing A and here Z. A stands for mass number. Z stands for atomic number. Now what is A? A stands for mass number. So A that is equal to number of protons plus number of neutrons. Why? Because properties of an uh, that uh, subatomic particles. You are aware that proton is having charge plus one. Keep in mind actual charge is different. But for general consideration we are taking this charge as plus one. Who discovered proton? Try to recollect in wrong experiment by Goldstein. So charge is plus one. Then mass for general purpose we are considering one AMU. That is one atomic mass unit. For detail it is considered as 1.0078 AMU. So these are the uh, important thing, location in the nucleus, who discovered a gold star. Second particle, neutron. Neutron was proposed by Rutherford only. But uh, because we are aware that in the tiny nucleus, all protons are staying together, which is just impossible. To answer that, Rutherford says that there must be some neutral particle that is coming in between. That's why he suggested neutron. But it was proved in much later date. In 1932, neutron was proved by Chadwick. So here, neutron charge is zero. It is not having any charge. Mass for general purpose, 1 AMU. But for detail purpose, it is 1.0086 AMU. Whereas location in the nucleus. The last particle here, that is electron, we are aware this is actually first subatomic particle discovered by Sir J. J. Thomson. It is having charge exactly equal to proton but opposite. So proton is having plus one charge, electron is having minus one charge. Mass, mass of electron is not constant. According to speed, mass of electron changes. But for general practice, we are considering it is 0.000. .000 555 AMU or rather I should say that is equal to 1 by 1850 AMU that means 1850 electron will come together then mass will be equal to 1 so electrons are uh, as compared to proton and neutron electrons are having negligible mass and therefore, mass number is denoted by only number of protons plus number of neutrons. Whereas, atomic number Z is only number of protons. But, you are aware that 
total number of proton equal to total number of electron in any atom and therefore we can consider whatever number of protons that is number of electron and this way z that will give you number of proton plus number of electron are you able to follow or let us go by some example so let us check out example sodium no doubt i am talking sodium and writing na because latin name of this element is natrium and therefore symbol is na its atomic number is 11 and mass number is 23 now mass number is 23 atomic number is 11 we have to find out a uh, a is there sorry a is number of protons plus number of neutrons Z, Z is what number of proton. So the, the Z is eleven. That is equal to number of proton, and that is also equal to number of electron. So in atom, number of electron is same as number of proton. Therefore, in case of sodium, eleven protons are there and eleven electrons are there. Now A is twenty three. Number of proton we got eleven plus number of neutron. So number of neutron that is equal to twenty three minus eleven that is equal to twelve. So simply we can say that a minus z will give me number of neutron. So twenty three minus eleven I am getting number of neutron. So this way we can calculate number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in any atom. so now you are aware of these all atoms they are having characteristic that is atomic number and accordingly atoms are now arranged now you are aware about the fundamental particles property some of the particles we discuss why i am saying some of the particles because we are at beginning right now there are so many sub atomic particles they are not always present at certain part only they can show their presence say for example you are aware of electron now like that similar particle but opposite in charge is present that is called as positron then there are mesons and so many so we are discussing right now only pure particles in the atom so we discuss proton neutron electron basic part so this is the way now we are switching over to electronic configuration now we are going to discuss how electrons are arranged in a shell this is some primitive level electronic configuration we are going to discuss uh why i am saying primitive level because after getting concepts clear we are going to discuss some higher level electronic configuration also so now you are aware how many electrons are there in atom that is uh, you are aware that is equal to their atomic number now you are aware that there are orbits different shells are there electrons are assigned in their shells you are also aware that capacity of shell is 2n square now uh, i am trying to prepare a table over here So here I write name of electron, uh, name of atom. So suppose I am writing here sodium, atomic number eleven, mass number twenty three. Now here uh, number of electrons in atom. So you are aware that atomic number that is equal to number of electrons in any atom. Actually, it is number of protons. But in any neutral atom, number of proton is equal to number of electrons. therefore i am writing here number of electron as 11 but this is not only sufficient capacity so here i am writing n equal to 1 that is the first shell capacity of capacity or number of electrons that is equal to 2 n square so 2 n square will be equal to 2 this shell is also denoted as letter k 
now n equal to 2 so 2n square will be equal to 2 into 2 square so 2 for the 8 so here capacity is 8 this chain is denoted by letter L n equal to 3 so 2n square that will be 3 3 is a, uh, 3, 3 is a 9 9 to the 18 so 18 this is denoted by letter M next shell n equal to 4 2n square will be 4 for the 16 into 2 32 shell is denoted by letter M n equal to 5 obviously 5 5 is a 25 to the 50 capacity is 50 this is denoted by letter O so <coughs> In table, we are writing out number of electrons here. Every time you have to keep in mind here 2 electrons, 8 electrons, 18 electrons, 32 and 50. Now let us first go for sodium, atomic number 11. So as atomic number 11, number of electrons we have to assign there also 11. Now first shell, now uh, what Bohr says, the first rule, the first rule is that we have to fill lower shells first and then upper shell. So here I will go for n equal to 1 first shell. I will fill 2 electrons here. Whereas total available electrons are 11. Out of that 2 are accommodated here. Now reminder 9. So here I have to keep 8 electrons because capacity of this shell is 8. So I have placed 8. 8 plus 2 10. Here 11 electrons are there, therefore reminder is 1. And then last electron I can keep here. No doubt, capacity is of 18. But less than 18 are allowed. More than 18, not allowed. So I have placed 1 electron. So this way we can write electronic configuration of sodium in this way. That is 2, 8, 1. 2, 8, 1. So this way we are writing out electronic configuration of sodium. And right here also 2, 8, 1. This way we can write configuration of sodium. Now next element. Uh, okay. Let me check whether you are able to follow or not. So next element I will give here. That is phosphorus. Atomic number 15. Mass number 31. So atomic number is 15 over here. So you have to go back phosphorus now. So number of uh, okay. Uh, pause this video and try to carry out electronic configuration yourself first, and then start this video and check out. So number of electron fifty for shell two, as it is maximum eight second shell eight plus two ten reminder five. Whereas last shell is having capacity eighteen. So I can keep 5 electrons as it is. So this way electronic configuration of phosphorus I can write 2, 8, 5. This way. So this is the case. We can check out electronic configuration with this one. This is given by Niels Bohr and we are making table. Tr uh, trying to make table more advanced possible. Let us check now electronic configuration of calcium. But for that purpose, we have to check another rule also. Hmm? Let me clarify that another rule. So first, I will write here electronic configuration of calcium uh, 20 mass number 40. So as this number is 20, number of electrons available is 20. I have to accommodate now 20 electrons in all this shell. Now, uh, as earlier, this is 2, 8, so 2 plus 8, 10. Reminder, 10. Here capacity is 18. So I should write 10 here. But here more place another rule that if last shell is having more than 8 electrons not permitted, we can keep at the most 8 electrons in this last shell. And therefore I have to remove this 10 and I have to place here 8 only. So, irrespective of capacity, I have to give only 8 electrons in last shell. So, I have placed here 8 
reminder is now 2 and that is placed in next shell. So that's why configuration of calcium, I am writing 2, 8, 8, 2 and not 2, 8 and 10 because if I am considering 2, 8 and 10 then last shell is having more than 8 electron, not permitted. Getting idea? Now you try yourself one more element here that is potassium atomic number 19 mass number 39. You try. Pause this video and then observe this video. Now uh, it is same to same like calcium only uh, number of electrons 19 first shell 2 electron second shell 8 2 plus 8 10 reminder 9 so supposed to be I have to write here 9 but we are aware of this rule last shell should not have more than 8 electrons and therefore I am removing this here I am writing 8 and last shell is having 1 electron so configuration is 2 8 8 one. Getting idea? So this is something the expected electronic configuration according to this table. Now condition is that uh, here some questions are always there in my mind that why 8 electrons I have to place here because ultimately it is not last shell now. Initially when 10 electrons are there it is last shell but now 2 electrons are here. So can I shift 7 electron and 3 electron, 6 electron and 4 electron, 5 electrons and 5 electrons, like that also? And therefore, we have problem. To solve this type of thing, these electronic configurations are used till only here. Suppose scandium is next element, atomic number 21, how we are going to assign? And like that, various questions are there. And this can be solved by next configuration given by Niels Bohr that is called as Aufbau principle. With help of Aufbau principle we can give certainly answers of these all questions. So let us check now Aufbau principle. Now we are discussing a concept of electronic configuration suggested by Niels Bohr that is called as Aufbau principle. This is something German word Aufbau. The meaning is that to fill up. So how electrons are fill up in the uh, atom. Now in previous part we discussed that there are shells n equal to 1, n equal to 2, n equal to 3 even that uh, shells are having name n equal to 1 that means k n equal to 2 that is l like that but that configuration is not that much sufficient because uh, that is applicable approximately till atomic number 20 that is applicable but further to that we require some different chart so I am showing you here right now the chart try to understand first because at end, we are going to discuss in detail once again with other data. So right now, we are uh, making a chart that is called as Aufbau principle. Now here, how electrons are arranged in the shells. For that purpose, this chart is there. But uh, how? That is shell, then there are subshells and capacities of that. So that we are going to discuss right now. You are aware that... Uh, people in different part of world they discover different styles of writing say for example in India we are writing this way from left to right in Europe also people are writing this way only that left to right but in Arabian subcontinent Persia they are writing from right to left like Urdu or ancient Indian script that is called as Kharoshtri but that was not Indian script that was uh, introduced by Persian people particularly in the valley of Indus 
This script was introduced, that is called as Khoroshtri script during Hakamani Empire. Japanese people, you are aware, they are writing. Actually, if I am writing this way, and I should call this right. But if I am writing this way, and what I should call? But Japanese people are writing in this way, top to bottom. Whereas, chemist, now writing from bottom to top. Now, what Afbao principle is there? For that purpose, various charts and various methods are available. I am teaching you only one method because my suggestion is that follow only that one method. Otherwise, lots of confusion people are doing and ultimately they are making atomic catastrophe. So forget of that, try to follow only one method. Now I will show here that method. So first, the orbits irrespective of uh, they are n equal to 1, n, n equal to 2, 3, like that. They are uh, given, distributed in the format S, P, D, F. They are subshells of every atom, uh, every orbit. S is having capacity 2. It is written on superscript. Superscript means above this. And that is in also form of small part. But don't read this as S square. While reading, we have to read as S2. The method is this. P6, D10 and F14. Again telling these are the maximum capacities of electrons in the suborbit or subshell. So these are the capacities I have mentioned over here. Now, how to write? It is 1s. I will start from this way. 1s. 1 indicate first orbit. S indicate subshell. Then 2s. After 2s, I will write here 2p. Say so for s, pdf. Sorry, for first 1, pdf is not there. For 2, it is only P. So S as well as P. 3S, 3P, 3D. 4S, 4P, 4D, 4M. See, every time I am increasing 1-1 one, one orbital. So here S, then P, then D and then F is last. Then 5S, 5P, 5D, 5F. May be possible, they are there. But whatever total atoms available today, they are having only this much. 6S, 6P, 6D, 6F. 7S, 7P, 7D, 7F. That's all. This is first. We are writing out all these orbitals clearly. So when I am saying 5D, it indicate main shell number 5, subshell D. Capacity of D is 10. It is written. Now, we have to join this. So we have to put a track. And like that we are arranging them in the track. So first track, second track, only one station here, only one station here. Now third track having two stations. While you are going to writing out, at that time you should not write one, two, three. Only draw lines. In some book they are showing lines this way, but over after that coming this way. And like that. But it is making diagram more complicated. Instead of that, keep in mind, travel from here to here, end, then go to next track. Go to next track, fourth, fifth, sixth, don't miss out anything, 
seven. Otherwise, what happens that sometimes some letters are missing out. Eight, nine, ten. Now, how to carry out electronic configuration? Let us perform it for sodium. So I am writing here sodium atomic number 11 mass number 23. Uh, we discuss this. How many electrons are there in sodium? Answer is 11. Why? Because this is atomic number. Now I have to arrange 11 electrons here. In previous part we discuss how electrons are arranged according to KLM. But now we are going to discuss in detail. So, uh, I have to assign 11 electrons. So, I will follow this track, track number 1. It is 1S. So, I will write 1S. How many electrons can be accommodated in S orbit? Answer is maximum 2. So, I will write here 2. Because I have 11 electrons to fill. Out of that 2, we have filled out. Next track, 2S. See, we are following this track, ended. Now start next track. Only one station is there, write down 2S. What is the capacity of S? Again 2. So write down 2. Don't read 1S square. Read 1S, 2. 2S, 2. Then go to third track, you will find 2P. So in 2P we can fill 6 electrons. Capacity is 6. Reminder 1. So check out it's 2 plus 2, 4 plus 6, 10. So after 2P there is 3S. So write down 3S and no doubt capacity is of 2. But available electron is only 1. Therefore write down it as 1. So this way we have mentioned that electrons in sodium they are like this. Now the previous questions. In previous session only we have doubt that why electronic configuration of calcium is 2882. Why not 28, 5 and 5? Okay, that answer we are going to find out here. Calcium atomic number 20, mass number 40. That means how many electrons are there? 20. Now we have to fill 20 electrons here. So I have to follow this chart 1s2. Then go to second track 2s2. Then third track 2p6. After that 3s2. Keep eye on the number of electrons. So it is 10 plus 2, 12. I have to accommodate 20 electrons. So 12 electrons already accommodated till 3s. Then go to next track, fourth track, we will get 3p. So 3p, 6. Now number of electron, 10 plus 6, uh, 16 plus 2, 18. So 18 electrons are filled here till 3p. Many students are committing mistake in general. They after 3p, they write 3d. So this is not this way we have to go. That's why I have produced track here. So after 3p, go to this line, you will get there. 4s and therefore it is 4s and we have two electrons so I am filling out. Now is it according to previous configuration? Answer is definitely yes. You are aware sodium configuration is 2, 8, 1. Let us check. First shell only two electrons are there. Second shell 2 plus 2, uh, sorry uh, that 2, 2 that is second shell 2 plus 6, 8 electrons are there. And last shell, only third shell is the last one. So electronic configuration is according to previous. 2, 8, 1. Let us go for a calcium. First shell only one. So write down 2. Second shell, 2s and 2p. So 2 plus 6, 8. Third shell, 3s and 3p. Total 2 plus 6, 8. And fourth shell, 2. Getting idea? That's why the configuration is... 2882 and not <clears throat> and not 2855 or any probability of that. So here it is clearly mentioned according to Aufbau principle. 
So Ava principle is actually a fantastic way to give electronic configuration of an element. So this is performed by me. Now you have to perform. Uh, obviously take this down, pause this video, take this all chart. Because you have to produce this chart your own. Produce that and then after writing these two examples, uh, go for the most complicated here. Carry out electronic configuration of uranium yourself. Atomic number 92, mass number 238. Try to do it yourself. Your, uh, what we can say, uh, management skill, calculation skill, like that and patience. Everything is tested here. Try to carry out electronic configuration of uranium. Uh, one more spoon feeding. You are aware how many electrons are there now? 92. You have to fill, uh, fill 92 electrons now. Start uh, electronic configuration of uranium now. Uh, you are aware that your skill, that uh, management skill and all calculation skill, they are playing important role here. So I will write here in a somewhat smaller size because I have to accommodate totally 92 electrons. As atomic number of uranium is 92, we have to accommodate 92 electrons. So 1s2, C, 1s2, then 2s, 2s2, then third track, 2p, 6, 3s2, next track, 3p, 6, then 4s2. So after 3p, again I am telling, 3d is not filled. After 3p it is 4s. Now fifth track, 3d, 10. I will keep here only 3d, 10. And I will get total of all. So 10, 10, 20, 10, 30. So here I will write total 30. So yet 62 electrons to fill. So after 3d it is 4p. So I will write here from 4p 6, then 5s2. Now 6 track 4d 10, 5p 6, 6s2. Okay. Uh, then we are going to 7 track where we will get 4f14. Then 5d 10. So I will make total here only. That is 6 plus 2, 8, 18, 24, 26, 30, 40, 50. So total is 80. So reminder 12. So 5d. Then I will go to 6p. 6p is 6. Reminder is 12. Out of that 6, 7 is 2. 8. So, uh, reminder is here 12. Out of that 8 is there. That means reminder is 4. After 7 is, we are going to next track. That is 5f. No doubt 5f. I can write 14. But I don't have electron. Electrons are only 4. So, I have to write here 4 electrons. And then, you can check the total. 6 plus 2, 8 plus 4, 12. Total is 2. 5 plus 1, 6 plus 3, 9. 92 is the total. So this way we carried out electron configuration of uranium. With skill, certain skills, not high class, but these skills are important. This is the way we are carrying out electronic configuration of sodium, uh, sorry, uranium. But uh, after making this type of huge electronic configuration, we want to assign them. How? I have to assign like that according to number. First shell first, second, third, like that. Let me clarify. Here I will collect only 1s is there. So I will write 1s, 2s, 2p, alright, 3. It is 3s2, 3p6. I have one last time that after 3p it is 4s. Then it is 3d. But here I have to arrange all three together. 
and therefore after carrying out this configuration i am assured then only i am writing 3d ten now 4s2 check out 4s 4p 4d 4f so i will write 4s2 4p6 4d10 4f 14 after that 5s so 5s2 5p6 5d10 and last 5f 4 now 6 shell it is 6s2 6p6 6d not under construction so keep it as it is and 7s you will come to know this is called as shell under construction whereas last shell is 7s2 or 7 remain unchanged uh, let me clarify uh, would you like to carry out one more electronic configuration next element of uranium is neptunium atomic number 93 That means what? You have to fill up ninety-three electrons. So right now you fill up with so many. Only one electron you have to add. Where you are going to add? Five F five. Next element of neptunium is plutonium. Five F six. That means this is called as shell under construction. Okay. So last shell, uh, last shell remains same. Second last shell remains same, and electrons are added in third last shell. This is the peculiarity of uranium. Therefore, it is called as inner transition element. Uh, you might have noticed that uh, when usually uh, we describe periodic table, we say that if last three shells are incompletely filled, then we are calling it a dam as uh, inner transition element. Question is always there in mind that if all earlier shells are filled first and then higher shells. Then why this is the situation? Why three shells are remaining uh, semi-filled? The thing is that uh, according to Oppo principle, this is the way, and therefore uranium is having last three shells incompletely filled. Shell under construction is third last, whereas second last and last shell remain unchanged. So I hope you might have carried out all these electronic configuration nicely. after successfully carrying out electronic configuration of uranium 92 and uh, neptunium 93 plutonium 94 i will give you some what simpler task to do now carry out electronic configuration of phosphorus atomic number 15 mass number 31 so Try to do electronic configuration of phosphorus. Now you may say that it is quite easy after observing this all. Say it's we have to accumulate only 15 electron. First pause this video. Try to make yourself. Then I will do. So 15 electrons I have to accumulate. One is two, two is two, two p six, three is two. Reminder. 10 plus 2 12 15 electron that means reminder 3 so electronic configuration is 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s2 3p3 so this is the way electronic configuration of phosphorus now if you are going this way you will find it is easy so first we have carried out simpler task then tough task and then again simpler task but life is not so simple as we are thinking so here another rule is applicable and we are going to do that that is called as hunt's rule of maximum multiplicity or that called as hunt's rule of maximum multiplicity that says that uh, when d generated orbitals are available first let me clear you the concept d generated orbitals d generated orbitals means orbital having same energy level then they are called as degenerated orbitals now here if i am saying these two orbitals let us check this is 3s graphically i will show this now 3p 
graphically i will show tp orbital is divided into three part whereas this is called as energy cap so 3s2 so this is first electron second electron now here question is that why i have shown this way because electron is shown uh it is revolving around nucleus but at the same time it is having spin motion it is revolving uh, rotating around its axis also you are aware that planets they are revolving around sun in our solar system but at the same time they are revolving around their axis also same way electrons are also revolving around their axis in case of planet is it possible that all planets revolve in same direction answer is no you will get surprising data that venus and uranus these two planets revolve in reverse way means earth rotates uh, sorry uh, not revolve rotate earth rotates from west to east direction am i wrong and reverse earth rotates west to east direction that's why you will find that sun is rising at east and setting at west so earth rotates from west to east many planets rotates in same way but venus and uranus though they rotate in exactly opposite way means they will rotate from east to west all right so this is the case so electron also rotate clockwise as well as anti clockwise so here by indicating this type of arrow i am indicating electron rotating clockwise by indicating this arrow i am rotating electron indicating anti clockwise so this way we are showing spin of electron that is clockwise and anti clockwise now according to the principle of magnetism any charge body is in motion i am revising any charge body is in motion it is going to produce magnetic field around it so electron is a charge body it is rotating also that's why it is producing magnetic field around it the clockwise spin will produce different magnetic field anti clockwise will produce different magnetic field opposite magnetic fields are there therefore there is attraction and that's why in a orbital two electrons can be accommodated but always keep in mind one will spin clockwise then other must spin anti clockwise parallel spin is not a energetically stable condition so here i should not say both are clockwise or both are anti clockwise i to say show one is clockwise other is anti clockwise now uh, p orbital according to uh, data i will explain in some other lecture but this is called as zeeman effect and stoic effect so in order to accommodate that they say that p orbital is subdivided into uh, according to say uh, x axis is there then we are calling it as 3p x orbital according to y orbital then we are calling it as 3p y orbital and according to z orbit uh, sorry z axis it is called as 3p z orbital so this way now i am changing this 3s to 3p3 in format of 3s box two electrons 3px 3py 3pz now as here is energy gap we are not saying these orbitals are degenerated but as here there is no energy gap so px py pz they are considering degenerated orbital that means they have same energy now first electron how many electrons i have accommodated three first electron i will say this way second electron actually i should show this way but no why because there is space available so why to go here so second electron will remain independent third electron will also remain independent instead of pairing out they will try to remain unpaired as far as possible hans rule is saying this same thing when degenerated orbitals are available electron will try to remain unpaired as far as possible so how we are going to modify this configuration so this configuration i am rewriting 1s2 2s2 
2p6, 3s2 is unchanged here, I will write this way, but p, I am now splitting this way, that 3p x1, 3p y1, 3p z1. Don't say 3p x1, y1, z1, because in mathematics we have habit of making common, so in 3p x, 3p y, 3p z, take 3p common x, y, z, so don't do that. Because these are the names of orbital and we can't say that with names of uh, uh, orbital something we can take common. So this is 3px, 3py, 3pz. This way we can do electronic configuration of phosphorus. Now next element you will try first then I will try chlorine atomic number 70. So first try yourself. I am just writing here chlorine atomic number 70. Mass number suppose 35. We are going to discuss electronic configuration of chlorine. So now your experience 1, 1H2, 2H2, 2P6, 3H2, 3P, 5. So according to Upbau principle, this is our electronic configuration. This is according to Upbau principle. Now we have to apply this Hunt's rule of maximum multiplicity. So I have to check for 3p5. So in case of this, first electron, second, third. But now there is no place for fourth electron to go. And then pairing is possible, but in reverse way. Now not necessary electron should go in x only. It may go in y, it may go in z, anywhere. But we have to consider alphabetically for sake of convenience. So, we are saying fourth electron is going this way, fifth electron will go this way. Okay, whereas there is no sixth electron, so no question. So, I will modify this configuration as 3p x2, 3p y2, 3p z1. So, this way we are modifying chlorine. Keep in mind, Hull's rule of maximum multiplicity that is used when P, D or F, these orbitals are last orbital and they are incompletely fit. Okay, for argon no need to explain, argon is having atomic number 18, so you can write down simply 3P6. Okay, uh, but if you are talking of incompletely filled orbital then this is required. So this is we are discussing about electronic configuration and we just studied out Hunt's rule of maximum multiplicity. Yeah. When we have to apply this Hunt's rule of maximum multiplicity, for that purpose keep in mind P, D, F, either of that orbital should be last orbital and second implied condition that should not be fully filled. For S orbital such splitting is not there. For P orbital, uh, just as shown P, X, P, Y, P, Z. If orbital is D, then uh, D orbital is split up into D X square minus Y square d z square d x y d y z d x z so like that five splits are there because you are aware d orbital is having 10 electrons each orbital should have only two electrons so in order to that d orbital is split up keep in mind d orbital is also degenerated orbital but in excited state it splits up, 2 will go upside, 3 will go downside, but that is not right now part of our study. So this part, uh, time to time, whenever particularly we discuss d block element, at that time we are going to discuss in detail. So here, this way, we can check out the split of d orbital, quantum numbers. Keep in mind, Whatever we have discussed right now, 
that only I'm going to discuss once again and little bit here and there. Only we are giving names now. So first we are saying quantum numbers. So uh, there are a total four quantum numbers we have to study. The first quantum number we have to study that is called as principal quantum number. We have discussed this as we discussed that there are shells that uh, we are calling them as n equal to 1, 2, 3 and so on. They are also termed something like n equal to 1 that is k, then l, m and so on. So this is called as principal quantum number denoted by letter k, l, m, n like that generally we denote it as a small n that is mentioned number it is all integers starting from 1, 2, 3, 4 like that theoretically speaking infinite shells are there but practically we are aware that we discuss only 7th is the last shell for existing number of electrons so uh, keep in mind last known element naturally occurring last known element is uranium atomic number 92 then onwards all elements are synthetic element so you might have noticed that a new element is discovered having atomic number 100 then uh, 105 107 111 like that so all these elements are synthetic element they are having uh, higher atomic numbers but not necessarily electron number is same and therefore we are not discussing much of that so we are discussing uh, in our knowledge we discuss uranium 92 where 5f was the last shell even it is not having 7f 6f is also not there in case of uranium and therefore we are not discussing much of that now we are aware of principal quantum number we say theoretically speaking infinite values are there but practically speaking seventh is the last shell now uh, this is called as principal quantum number second quantum number we are going to discuss that is denoted by letter small l this is called as azimuthal quantum number what word we are using here azimuthal quantum number so azimuthal quantum number is having value 0 2 and minus 1 why i am writing this way many times it is mentioned that only n minus 1 no it is having value from 0 to n minus 1 let me clarify if shell number 5 is there let us consider shell number 5 for shell number 5 obviously n will be equal to 5 if n is equal to 5 then value of l will be 0 2 now 5 minus 1 that will be 4 and therefore values are 0 1 2 3 4 getting idea so this way value of L that is determined it is not only 4 it is 0 to 4 all integers we have to consider now let us go step by step straight away just I show what is L but now we are going to discuss somewhat detail so let us consider n equal to 1 if n is equal to 1 then l will have value from 0 to n minus 1 that is from 0 to 1 minus 1 that means from 0 to 0 that means only 0 now if I am writing electronic configuration in the manner that first shell that is principal quantum number followed by azimuthal quantum number we may read this as 1 0 no rather many people may read this as 10 and confusion is there to avoid that confusion this 0 is written as s and therefore a value of s is actually speaking here 0 don't misconcept between capacity and value 
capacities number of electron we can accommodate that is 2 where at 0 is value of azimuthal quantum number now as a result you can check that 1s because n equal to 1 there is only s we have not written here 1p 1d 1f so first shell is only having value s now let us put n equal to 2 you will find the value of l will be 0 and 1 2 minus 1 1 so as value is 1 it is denoted by letter p that's why you will get here 2s and 2p there is no 2d 2p uh, sorry 2f only 2s and 2p let us consider n equal to 3 the value will be 0 1 2 by 2 n minus 1 so 3 minus 1 2 so 2 that means d and 3 that is f rest of the things may be there but we don't want to write because electrons are not there so n equal to 3 n equal to 4 then l value will be 0 1 2 3 getting idea so n equal to 2 only 2 orbitals are there n equal to 3 we are getting 3 orbitals now d but f is absent n equal to 4 you will get all 4 orbitals 1 2 3 4 so for 4 s p d and f all these orbitals are available so this is called as azimuthal quantum number that's why i told that uh, whatever we have discussed that only we have to discuss again but repeating but we are adding out one one concept more so here we discuss principal quantum number azimuthal quantum number but while above principle discussing we didn't discuss that but now you are aware that how values are assigned when we are talking 3p say by writing i will write 3p but in your mind it should be clear 3 but p means what 1 so we have to keep in mind it is 3 and 1 but if i am writing 3 and 1 then 1 may leave 31 and therefore this arrangement is there that second number is replaced by letter but that second number or that letter that is called as azimuthal quantum number now we have to discuss third quantum number that is called as magnetic quantum number now we are going little bit detail uh, according to Niels uh, sorry According to Sir J.J. Thomson's atomic model, electrons were stationary, they were embedded in the atom. That is also water muon shape, something uh, water muon model. But when we are talking of ruler force model, electron is not stationary, electron is in motion, in motion, it is performing circular orbit around it. According to Niels Bohr's model, Elect uh, nucleus is at center suppose electrons they are forming a cloud over nucleus it is uh, for example distributing equally around nucleus now here if you check out the radius or rather I should say diameter of atom it is of the uh, range in terms of angstrom you are aware that one angstrom that means 10 raised to minus 10 meter that means simply I have to say 1 upon 10 to the power of 10 meter now see the calculation whereas what is speed of electron almost equal to speed of light not exactly equal to speed of light but it is almost equal to speed of light and you are aware speed of light is 3 lakh kilometer per second so in a second electron should travel not 3 lakh let us imagine 2 lakh kilometer not that slow but yes let us imagine so 2 lakh kilometer distance electron will cover within one second but the available space is 10 to the minus 10 uh, 10 to the power of minus 10 meter less than that so 1 upon 10 to the power of minus 10 meter so tiny space is available so imagine the way electron will revolve around nucleus 
and then can we locate out an electron answer is no it is very very difficult for us to locate out an electron uh, keep in mind nobody ever seen all this i am not able to see single atom in childhood i was having concept something like that with microscope we can uh, check out uh, cell we can observe cell in the cell also nucleus is there vacuoles and all these things are there so like that there will be some microscope with that help of microscope we can see the atoms but yet no such atom uh, no such microscope is developed yet that's why we have to go on imaginary basis suppose you have this type of microscope and saying again it is not developed yet student may have misconceived that electron microscope can able to locate out electron answer is no but suppose imagine you have such a microscope where you can see single atom like huge a uh, football like that if you are able to observe single atom then can we locate electron there answer is no because electron will complete 2 lakh kilometer distance in one second it's greater than diameter of earth it is greater than circumference of earth too high too long distance that will cover within a second and so there is a principle that is called as hazenberg's uncertainty principle i am revising name of principle that is called as hazenberg's uncertainty principle according to this principle it is difficult to locate out an electron either we can locate out exact position of electron or we can locate out uh, we can find out exact momentum of electron but right now forget of momentum so with hazenberg's uncertainty principle i can say certainly that it is difficult to locate out an electron in atom then what i can locate out i can locate out the area i can locate out the region where electron finding probability is maximum i am not saying where electron will be there i can get that electron what word we are using here electron finding probability is maximum that region is called as orbital getting idea now these orbitals are having different shapes for example s orbital keep in mind s sphere so s orbital is spherical in shape electron density is distributed all around nucleus equally so this is something shape of s orbital the p orbital is having dumbbell shape now in our book it is written as dumbbell shape i am saying dumbbell shape but i should say rather instead of dumbbell that shape resembles to infinite sign to closer extension this is the shape so what i should say infinite but in book it is written dumbbell shape so i am saying it is dumbbell shape so this is or if it is vertically this way then we can say shape of eight that is also right option but they say it is shape of dumbbell so we are saying dumbbell shape now second part uh, when we observe spectra we are checking out uh, we discuss about spectra spectra means what that particular radiation is emitted by substance or particular radiation is absorbed by substance if substance is absorbing radiation then we are calling it as absorption spectra if substance is emitting out then uh, thing then we are calling it as emission spectra so right now we are concerned about emission spectra so particular wavelength only emitted but if you place that sample in strong magnetic field then spectral lines are split up into two parts if you are placing that substance in strong magnetic field then you may observe spectral lines are split up this effect is called as zeeman effect now instead of magnetic field suppose we use strong electric field direct current so if you are using strong electric field then same effect is observed this is called as stark effect why this is so to account this 
they carried out uh, research and they say that p orbital is having dumbbell shape electron density uh, now you are aware of this word electron density uh, that means uh, where electron find it is not density of electron electron finding probability is maximum in particular area then we say electron density is more so uh, let's say this is the coordinate system this is called as x axis this is called as y axis this is called as z axis actually on this board this is x and this is y whereas z axis is protruding out like this perpendicular but i can't show 3d and therefore i am showing only 2d that's why i am tilting out say so don't say this is an acute angle this is also a 90 degree that is perpendicular this is also 90 degree okay just imagine this is three dimensional so uh, if electron density is distributed along with x axis in case of p then this is called as px orbital if electron density is distributed equally in case of y orbital uh, y axis then it is called as py and if electron density is distributed equally in this direction dumbbell shape towards z axis then it is called as p z orbital so this is px py pz this is in order to account zeeman effect stirk effect all that so this way shape of orbitals are there uh, now we have to account this that is called as magnetic quantum number so we are now focusing on magnetic quantum number magnetic quantum number is denoted by letter m and value values are something like that for every value of azimuthal quantum number because we are aware azimuthal quantum number is connected with principal quantum number so every value of azimuthal quantum number it is having minus l to 0 and 0 to plus n let me clarify if n equal to 1 we are aware if n equal to 1 then l equal to 0 and therefore magnetic quantum number will be minus 0 to 0 to plus 0 but keep in mind yet no mathematicians with my knowledge but no mathematicians are able to detect this type of figure minus 0 and plus 0 in maths there is only 0 0 can't be minus and can't be plus so magnetic quantum number value is 0 that's why uh, electron density is distributed everywhere equally that is s orbital but when we are talking of p orbital uh, let us check l equal to 2 uh, sorry n equal to 2 If l equal to two, then value of l is zero and one. So if l is one, that means orbital is p. For p orbital, I may say minus one to zero and zero to plus one. That means p orbital is splitting out into three. One is p x, other is p y, and third is p z. Try to recollect. We discuss this everything under name Hund's rule of maximum multiplicity. So this is called as Hund's rule of maximum multiplicity. For that purpose, we discuss the split of p orbital into p x, p y, p z. But energetically, their their energy is same. Whether electron densities are arranged according to x axis, y axis, or z axis, and therefore, yeah, there uh, these orbitals are called as d generated orbitals that is they are having same energy now this is magnetic quantum number if p if d is there then you are aware d value is 2 so we have to give value as minus 2 minus 1 0 1 plus 2 so d orbital is divided into Five, two, three, four, and five. Just uh, we discussed in earlier part. 
that is dx square minus y square dz square dxy dyz dxz so like that so this is called as magnetic quantum number after that last part we are going to discuss that is called as spin quantum number this also we discuss electron is having spin motion one is clockwise other is anti clockwise so if electron spins clockwise we have to denote it by plus half whereas electron is spinning anti clockwise it is denoted as minus half so this way spin quantum number is there for every orbital plus half and minus half now why spin quantum number we are denoting here in terms of plus half and minus half uh, i am not going in detail but only want to explain there are categories of particles no no electron proton neutron all these things but uh, there are many particles and then they are categorized as fermion and boson if fermion is there the particles are denoted by value half 3 by 2 like that values are there for fermion so electron belonging to this category fermion therefore electron is denoted as plus half and minus half so plus half means clockwise spin minus half means anti clockwise spin so like that spin number that is there so total four quantum numbers are there as i discussed first quantum number is principal second is azimuthal third is magnetic and fourth spin uh i hope you are very much clear about these all quantum numbers but yet i want to give you example so take it a uh, simple exercise you have to perform give all four quantum numbers of last electron of chlorine i'm revising give all four quantum numbers of last electron of chlorine now you are aware that chlorine first we have to go by electronic configuration of chlorine so chlorine is having atomic number 17 so i have to assign 17 electron so just take down uh, you have already carried out electronic configuration of chlorine you can check it down 1s2 2s2 2p6 as it is 3p5 i have to assign that 3p x 3p y 3p z so first electron that's why we are showing here half otherwise hmm? i have to show by full arrow but this is to indicate half means what it is category of fermion 3p y 3p z 3 i have to accommodate five electron so this is fourth electron this is fifth electron one clockwise one anti clockwise so what is remaining electron that is 3pz is the last so i have to assign quantum number of 3pz so uh, first i have determined which is the last electron that is there in 3pz and now we are writing out c 3p so first i have to write down principal quantum number so as i am talking of only this electron principal quantum number is 3 as you know quantum number it may be 0 1 2 but i am talking of only this as a result as you know quantum number of p p means what 1 so here l equal to 1 now magnetic quantum number you are aware minus 1 0 Plus one. So with this terminology, it can be plus one. And lastly, spin quantum number that I don't know because electron is unpaired. So it can be clockwise or anti-clockwise. So like that, we can find out from this data all four quantum numbers of last electron of chlorine. Same way, we can go here and find out. Uh, now you carry out exercise in the same fashion uh, 
लास्ट इलेक्ट्रॉन ऑफ फॉस्फरस एटॉमिक नंबर फिफ्टीन सो इलेक्ट्रॉनिक कॉन्फिग्रेशन इज वेरी इन फ्रंट ऑफ यू यू कैन चेक आउट विद दैट यूल गेट द डेटा दिस वे सो थ्री पी एक्स थ्री पी वाई थ्री पी सेट बट अगेन सेम थिंग आई हैव टू फोकस ऑन थ्री पी सेट सो एज इट इज थ्री पी सेट सेम डेटा इज रिपीटेड एन इक्वल टू थ्री एन इक्वल टू वन बट सॉरी हा एन इक्वल टू प्लस वन एंड एस दैट विल बी आयर प्लस हाफ और माइनस हाफ सो दैट इज देअर फॉर फॉस्फरस वन मोर एक्सरसाइज Uh, find out all four quantum numbers of last electron of potassium atomic number 19 first you do pause this video then also potassium atomic number 19 electronic configuration 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s2 3p6 4s1 so last electron is there in 4s1 now i have to go By 4s1 configuration, so as I am writing here 4s1, it's very clear that n equal to 4l. No doubt, 0, 1, 2, 3. But here it is s, and you are aware s means what? 0. So l is 0. So there is no plus 0 and minus 0. So magnetic quantum number is also 0. Whereas spin quantum number either plus half or minus half. <clears throat> so this way we can find out quantum numbers all four quantum numbers of atom uh, of all electrons now one more named data that is called as pauli's exclusive principle he is the intelligent one by observing all these thing he says in a single atom no two electrons are having all set of quantum numbers same to same i mean why see in a single atom there are we can't find two electrons having same set of all quantum numbers is it true answer is extremely so you can take any orbital say for example let us check example i will give you example uh, let us go for magnesium magnesium is atomic number 12 so atomic number 12 means electronic configuration 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s2 let us consider 3s2 set so electron 1 and electron 2 n obviously you can check 3s therefore n is 3 here also n is 3 L S I so zero zero M as L is zero M is also zero so here all three sets are same but fourth set spin quantum number if this is plus half then this is minus half and if this is minus half then this is plus half because in orbit we have to show electron like this. One is clockwise, one is anti-clockwise. As a result, all four sets are not getting same. Lastly, spin quantum number differs. This is Pauli's exclusive principle. All right. So we discuss name-wise. We discuss, uh, say for example, Aufbau principle. Aufbau means to fill up. Then we discuss Hund's rule of maximum multiplicity. Then we discuss. Uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Then we discuss Zeeman effect, Stark effect. Then all quantum numbers we discuss. Now we discuss about Pauli's exclusive principle. This way we discuss almost all part of atomic structure. I am again saying that it is not hundred percent knowledge. Okay, but comparatively good set of knowledge is provided to you. time to time when we proceed further this lecture you have to consider as fundamental lecture as we proceed further time to time we are getting different data okay so electronic configuration right now i have explained that is according to of bow principle 
But when we will discuss electronic configuration about lanthanide element, then only above principle is not working there. We have to use some different principles also. So with fundamental knowledge, this chapter is almost all finished. Yet few things are there. Uh, after all this discussion, uh, in latter phase, scientists discovered, for example, D. Broglie. D. Broglie says, electron is not a particle. Electron is wave also. Then we have concept of dual nature of matter. At a time, matter can be experienced in form of wave and at a time it can be experienced in form of matter. So like that dual uh, nature of matter. If you are applying that, then how we can say that electron is having positive charge or negative charge or something like that. Just we discussed there is antiparticle of electron that is called as positron having positively charge. So like that various concepts are there and that's why changes occur. Then there is equation that is Schrodinger's equation but I have not discussing that. I have ended the chapter till Heisenberg's uncertainty principle that it is difficult to locate out an electron in atom. So we can find out a region where electron finding probability is more. So this is all about our discussion. Thanks for observing this.